Grace is yours, mercy is yours, and peace is yours from God our Father and from our dear Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Our text today is uh, the lessons that we've already uh, listened to, especially the epistle and the gospel. I'd like to start today by just asking what names you're called by. And one that we all share probably in this room is the name American. And with that... um, that name comes all kinds of rights and privileges, and, and, and it carries uh, some freight across our world. Now, some people might look at Americans as, you know, the ugly American. That was an old movie. Because sometimes our behavior isn't always that good. On the other hand, people very often welcome the Americans and American government into their, their world because they know that the American government often comes to places that are in deep distress. And when you're traveling in the world, um, you have rights and privileges that uh, are yours because you're an American. We're getting ready to go to Uganda, and we registered with the embassy in Uganda so that they know when we're going to be in country. And, and part of the reason for doing that is should something happen that they, they can get a message to all of us about anything that might happen that might affect our travel when we're there. And... Um, and, and, and they take care of their citizens. There's a special relationship that happens when you wear this particular name. Some people are identified by their political affiliation. So if you say a Republican, or you say a Democrat, or you say an Independent, or you say somebody who is a member of the Green Party, those things mean something. It has to do with ideology. It has to do with what you believe are the best ways to solve some of the problems that we face in our society. And people can have different opinions about what's the best way. But when you use a label like that, what happens is, is, that, um, is that the positions of those particular parties, whether it's the Green Party, the Democrat, or Republican Party, any of those parties become associated with what you believe about the right way to handle some of the problems in our political state. Many people are identified by their love for their teams, right? So... Um, You could say, are you a Wisconsin Badger? Well, you either are because you went to school at the UW-Madison campus, like my father, brother, and son, right? Or you have to be an adopted son like me, right? And, And certainly we're identified very often by our team affiliations, and that's especially true. Boy, there's a lot going on in Wisconsin, right? We got the Brewers who started on a hot streak. We got the Bucks in the playoffs. We got the Packers who just drafted people, right? And all of those kind of things uh, go on, but when you get associated with a team, it says something about where your loyalties lie. On the other hand, uh, it might also give you a different picture, because, for instance, if I say Bears fan to a Packer fan, it brings a different connotation, doesn't it? Or uh, Saturday, I had uh, yesterday, I had the funeral for a fellow who was a United States Marine and served in Vietnam. If I say Marine, or if I say Airman, or I say Soldier, or I say sailor, all of those words mean something about the training that that person's been through, the commitment that that person has made to the country. All of those things mean something when you think about those identities. And what these are, are labels that identify some aspect of our character, our personality, our beliefs, about how we're making our journey through our world. And And today we want to think a little bit more deeply about this name. It's the word Christian. Uh, It's only used three times in the Bible. Only used three times in the Bible. Uh, And the first time is in our first lesson today. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And as I said to the kids, it was not a laudatory term. It was a pejorative term. To say you were a Christian was to say something that was bad about you. Remember, the Christians were persecuted in the early ages. And, and, and today, unfortunately, very often in our culture and our society, 
in the United States, the word Christian does not carry a good connotation in a lot of people's minds. David Kinneman, who works for um, the Barna Research Organization, does a lot of area, uh, research in the area of faith, asked the Mosaics and the Busters uh, what they understood or how the name Christian uh, affected them. Um, you can see half of the people, that's the light kind of uh, uh, orangish uh, color, uh, said it had a bad impression. Now these are mosaics and busters, so these were people who were uh, born, as it says there, between uh, r- roughly 1965 and, ni- and, and 2002. If you ask that population of young, younger people, um, what is your opinion of the, somebody who's called a Christian, it was, for most people, 50% of the people, a negative impression. The second largest area there is neutral. Well, I don't even think something good or bad about somebody who carries that name. But you notice that little sliver of green are the only people who, who, would, who responded by saying it means something good. What does that tell you about our culture and about where we as followers of Jesus are in it? Well, you'll hear uh, things said like this. I've got nothing against God. It's his fan club I can't stand. And in fact, it was, um, some, I, I couldn't remember which one it was. Somebody told me last night. It was C.S. Lewis quoting G.K. Chesterton who said uh, something like this. The best argument for Christianity and the best argument against Christianity is the life of a Christian. What does that mean? Well, that means that unless you and I are living consistently as followers of Jesus Christ, the name Christian becomes a pejorative rather than a laudatory term. And this is not something that is new. As I said, when this was first given to Christians, it was a negative uh, had a negative connotation. Uh, one of the earliest uh, Roman historians by the name of Tacitus in one of his annals wrote this. He said, consequently, to get rid of the report, that is that Nero started the fire in Rome. You remember that uh, part of history? There was a big fire in Rome, and um, somebody thought Nero started it in order to enhance his political uh, situation. Well, it says, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero... Fe- fastened the guilt, and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name Christians had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, that's crucifixion. During the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procreators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. What was that mischievous superstition? It was, Christ is risen. risen Christ is risen. risen Christ is risen. risen One of the most telling Evidences for the power of Christ's resurrection is the fact that in the face of this kind of opposition, the Christian church continued to to grow, that followers of Jesus continued to multiply. And one of the neat things about Tacitus' account is it gives us a completely secular uh, verification of the of the details that are in the gospel accounts that Jesus was crucified that it was done at the hands of a man by the name of Pontius Pilate, and that there was this extraordinary superstition that he rose from the grave again that lit the fire uh, for the spread of Christianity in those early days. But again, to wear the name Christian then was not a very positive thing. And we might say, well, why isn't it positive now? Because uh, somebody gathered together some of the contrasts that people see when they see somebody who carries the name Christian. And this is what they said. Christians say that God loves unconditionally, but then they often love other people with a set of conditions. Christians say Jesus came not to judge the world, but to save it. But Christians are known for telling everyone 
about God's judgment for their sin. Christians say that God is the creator of the world and love the world he created, but Christians very often are those who are seen to act like they couldn't care less about what happens to the planet. Christians say, love the sinner, hate the sin, but they love to tell sinners that God hates their sin. Christians say, as Jesus said in the gospel lesson to this, uh, to, today, by, all, <clears throat> by this all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. Uh, we say that, but we're mostly known for unloving behavior towards people we don't agree with or judgmental behavior against uh, even fellow Christians. I had uh, one young man who would fit into that, um, that category of those who maybe had a little bit of a negative impression on Christianity, um, who thankfully has come around. But he, I asked him, I said, well, why did you, you kind of fall away from God for a little bit? Because he said I was raised in the church. He said, because, you know, he said, one of the things that I had a hard time reconciling in my brain is that I would, growing up in a small town, almost everybody went to church. I would sit in church with people on Sunday morning, and we would talk about, uh, you know, what God has done for us and how he loves us and how he's called us to love each other. And then we'd go for brunch in the local cafe, and everybody would be gossiping about everybody else. And the very thing that uh, we did right after church didn't align with what everybody said we should be doing in church. And, and so there are these inconsistencies between what we say we believe, what we say we value, what we say Jesus would have us do, and the way we live our lives. And that's why so often people judge us as hypocrites. Now, uh, to be fair, I like to say, especially when you're a part of a Lutheran church that believes in this thing called confession and absolution, that we're anything but hypocritical. Because what's the first thing we do when we come to church? We confess that we screwed up again. And, and, and we admit that we don't always live in line with our behavior. But this is a call to remind us that when we carry the name of, of Christ in this world, other people are judging what they think about Him based on what they see in us. There are only three times in the Bible, as I said, where it calls us Christians. And the first two times are by people who are not Christian. The first time is in the city of Antioch where they, for the first time, called those who follow Jesus Christians. The second time is in the words of um, Agrippa to Paul. Now, if you know that story, Paul is before Agrippa on trial, and, and he uses it as an opportunity to testify to what he believes in Jesus, and this is Agrippa's response. He says, do you think that in a, such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Again, used by a non-believer of uh, believers. The only time it's used by a believer is in Peter's letter as he's writing to Christians who are being persecuted. And, and, and obviously being persecuted because they wear the name Christian, a derogatory name in, in the Roman times in which they lived. And Peter says this. He says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Praise God that you bear that name. And, and what Peter does in his letter is he encourages them to wear that Christian well that name Christian well, to wear it in a way that gives testimony to the love and grace that they've experienced from God and the love and grace they want to share with other people in this world. In fact, the favorite New Testament word for a follower of Jesus is not the word Christian, but it is the word... Okay, this is where you're supposed to answer. I think I heard it, actually. It's the word disciple. I heard it. The favorite New Testament word for a follower of Jesus is not Christian, it's the word disciple, which comes from a Greek word that means to learn, and, and it's made a verbal noun, so it means really to be a learner. But what are we learning? Well, yes, we're learning about our salvation, that Jesus died and rose for our sins. Yes, we're learning about uh, the fact that he has opened the door to eternal life by his resurrection from the grave. But we're also learning to walk in his footsteps to love as he loved and to live as he lived. And 
And so the, the favorite word, even in the book of Acts, before this word Christian is introduced, when it describes uh, followers of Jesus, it uses this word disciples. In Acts 6, it says, so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. A little bit later in Acts chapter 9, it says, when when Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. You notice he didn't try to join the Christians. He tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple, that is, a follower of Jesus. And and then somebody that Paul eventually raised from the dead, this uh, woman named Tabitha or Dorcas, In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Now, you notice what this disciple did. She was doing good and helping the poor. You know, one of the things that that assisted in that early church, the, um, the Christian brand, as it were, the Christian name, is that Christians would step into difficult situations. They would take babies who had been left to be exposed to die, and they would adopt them and raise them. They would, when there was a breakout, and this happened a number of times of disease in in the early centuries, they would be willing to go into that disease community and, 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 and bring care to those who were suffering. Something everybody else would try to stay away from. And so they built a great brand, this brand called Christian, and, and it continued to, to, to grow. But we need to be reminded, as Warren Buffett says, it takes 20 years to build a reputation. It only takes five minutes to destroy it. And this is uh, something that we are called to in our own day and age to wear this name well, especially uh, something that uh, Luther prayed for once. He, He said this, he said, May a merciful God preserve me from a Christian church in which everyone is a saint. I want to be and remain in the church and the little flock of the faint hearted, the feeble, and the ailing, who feel and recognize the wretchedness of their sins, who sigh and cry to God incessantly for comfort and help, and who believe in the forgiveness of sins. And, and what our text calls us today to do is to be involved in something called brand rehabilitation. You know what that is. That's when something happens and the brand takes a hit. A while back it was Tylenol took a big hit. And that company expended a great deal of resources to revitalize their brand, to rehabilitate their brand. And the question is, is, as you and I walk through this world, do we ask ourselves this question, question, how would Jesus act, live, behave, talk in this particular situation? Because Jesus had said to his disciples again on Monday, Thursday evening, right after our gospel lesson today, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done, even greater works, because I'm going to the Father. Now, he wasn't talking about dying on the cross, only he could do that work. But the work of loving and serving, of revealing God's heart of love to the people of this world, It's a work that Jesus did and he does for you and for me. And he does it especially with people who don't know him. You know, Jesus only saved his harshest words for people like me, for preachers, for chief priests, Pharisees. When you read in the Bible, he saves his harshest words for those people. But when he meets somebody who doesn't know the love of his father, who who hasn't experienced the grace that God can give, who needs to know the healing that God can bring into their their lives, He treats them with great care, great love. And this is what Jesus calls us to when He says, this is our cross, when He says, if you want to be a disciple, not a Christian, but if you want to be a disciple, a Christ follower, then you got to daily pick up your cross and follow Me. And that happens as we follow his example. Jesus said at the supper, I am among you as one who serves. And so what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, yes, it is about what we believe, but 
in a biblical way of thinking about it, it's more about what we do. Jesus, when he described disciples, said this, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who's my disciple, truly I tell you that person will certainly not lose their reward. And you and I won't know when Jesus gave us a picture of the judgment, right? He said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was sick and in prison and you came and visited me. Whatever you've done to one of these least, the least of these you've done for me. And he invites us to pick up our cross, to ask that question each and every day. What is it, Jesus, you would call me to do today to represent you to the world, to my coworkers at work, to my children, to my parents, to my brothers and sisters, to my wife, to my husband? What is it that you're calling me today to do to love you and and to love them in the way that you would love them. Because you see, when we ask that question, then we're, we're helping to revitalize this brand so that that little sliver of green can grow, so that people look at those who wear the name Christian or Christ follower in a positive way. I think Maya Angelou, in one of her poems, caught this pretty well. This is what she wrote. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not shouting I'm clean living. I'm whispering I was lost, but now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I'm a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble, and I need Christ to be my guide when I say I'm a Christian. I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need His strength to carry on. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws, they're far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I'm a Christian, I feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's good grace somehow. And as grace receivers, then, we become grace givers when we wear the name of Jesus by following in his footsteps, by loving and serving. And, and the question then as we wake up every morning is, how am I going to wear that name today? Do we hear in our morning devotions God saying, remember whose child you are when you go out into the world today. Remember what it is I've called you to share as you go out into this world today. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, so also you should love one another. For by this all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And so our prayer is for forgiveness for those times we haven't. And our prayer is by the power of the Spirit that God would help us love and live like Jesus. Would you rise and let me pray about that? Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you that... Uh, by the power of your Spirit coming to our hearts, we bear your name. We're included in your family. And we ask, Lord, that, um, that you would forgive us for the times when, because of our words and our behaviors, that dishonor was brought upon your name and on the name Christian. And, and we just ask, Lord, that as we grow in your love and life, as we live as children of the resurrection, that you would help us once again be raised from death to life each and every day so that we wear your name in a way that brings honor and glory to you, that lets your light shine in us so that people might see by what we say and by what we do the glory of your Father in heaven. In your name, amen. May now that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in your Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, 
and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again from, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father all, that he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. From Psalm 118, you are my God and I'll praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Please be seated as we give thanks to the Lord, both with our offerings and with our voices as our offerings are gathered. 